Hey everybody, welcome to TCP Talks with Jonathan Baker and Justin Rowley from The Cloud Pod. In this series, we're bringing you interviews with the best and brightest leaders and heroes from the tech and cloud industry. Hi, this is Peter Rosakis with The Cloud Pod. I get to spend some time today with Christine Yen, CEO of Honeycomb. Uh, Christine, great to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. So, you know, to start, why don't you just give a quick summary of what Honeycomb is, how it helps your customers? We are an observability platform. We help our customers understand why what they thought their code should be doing is not, in fact, how their code is behaving. Awesome. Um, how did you get the inspiration to start Honeycomb? My Right before Honeycomb, um, I joined a company called Parse. Um, it was a mobile backend as a service, um, and that's where I met my co-founder. She was the first ops hire, uh, ended up running the infrastructure and backend teams. Uh, I was brought in and built out our analytics product, um, classic dev. I didn't want to think about production. Ops people were scary. I just wanted to build my software. Um, and the nature of building this backend as a service meant that we were abstracting away a lot of complexity for all of our customers. They just wanted to build their mobile apps, and we you know, would handle data storage and login and all of these things for them, which meant that anytime something was going wrong for them, they would write in and just say, parse is broken, parse is down, fix it. And we would have to go and scramble and try to figure out, okay, well, what does broken mean for you? And what, is that, what does that look like? And, <laughs> and then like excruciatingly get those details and then go and try to look through our, you know, our systems to see if we could figure out if there was something actually broken or if they were just, you know, not turning the Wi-Fi on. Um, <laughs> at the time, this is 2012, we had logs and we had metrics and there was this class of problem that was really, really hard to solve with these sort of traditional tools. Um, you know, at the time we were handling, we had tons of thousands, you know, tons of tons of traffic. Mm -hmm. say. Um, heterogeneous traffic, big customers, tiny customers. And I still remember the day um, we hired a salesperson. A couple weeks in, he walks over to Charity's desk and he's like, hey, Charity, Disney's started a trial and they're saying that they're having a terrible experience. And I mean, again, we're handling this huge volume of traffic. Disney's traffic is a trickle because they're trialing, but it really, really mattered. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, crap. Can't find it in our logs, too much data there, too much garbage. Our metrics lo are looking at our sort of high level health of the system, which is drowned out by the you know, huge deluge of folks who are doing just fine. And so the, the, the way that you solve that problem then is you go in and you go into the code and you add a if app ID equals Disney, spit out a different graph. So we did that and like, you know, that sort of thing, it, it works. It just takes hours and sometimes like half a day, depending on code review, whatever. And, um, you know, we, we, we got on, we got by, um, small startup. We were scrappy. We we're like, we could, we can make this work. 2013, we were bought by Facebook. And one of the Oof. things that happens with these big companies, right? They're like, Oh, little company. You're so cute. Here are our big kid toys. You know, you should be using all of our tools. And for the most part, tools that a PHP monolith for consumer traffic, uh, totally unsuitable for mobile backend as a service with polyglot storage and all the, all the newfangled things. But there was this one system internal to Facebook because, you know, they had their logging tool and they had their grown-up me metrics tool. But they had this other thing called Scuba that made a set of trade-offs that was unlike anything that we'd seen. And once we started getting our data flowing into it, it turned that problem of what's happening with Disney into something that took seconds instead of hours, hours. or days. It was something that cut through, you know, let, would let us look at our top level metrics, latency, throughput, whatever. But for any arbitrary customer, we started going, holy crap, not having to predict ahead of time what matters is making such a difference in our ability as engineers to get ahead of issues, identify them quickly, resolve them, understand who, who is being impacted by any given change. Um, and for, you know, honestly, when, when each of us were thinking about leaving Facebook, there was this sentiment of, but I don't, I don't want to have to do this again without scuba. Oh, I don't want to have to nice. do this without this experience. Um, and so we honestly, 
I don't think either of us really were the, were the type to dream of starting a company. Um, but there was just this magic of right problem, right partners, and right time. Um, her as an ops, me as a dev, we've, we were excited about sort of being able to bring our perspectives together to build this tool and bring it to, again, all engineers, not just ops folks and not just just developers. Um, so that's the origin of Honeycomb. That's awesome. I mean, I love that it, uh, not Ivory Tower product, like this is your pain and what you found was going to work for your real problems. So you mentioned dev and ops. So I can't, I can't help but say, what do you think about the companies now are saying, hey, we're, we're a DevOps model. You run, you build it, you run it. And asking, you know, hiring full stack, air quotes, developers who, you know, it's really tough to be, in my opinion, to, to do it all. But asking them to do it all, figure out how to build their infrastructure on, a, on the cloud, figure out how to build the app, features and functionality, and then figure out how to make it scale, and then monitor and manage it. So with all due respect, um, <laughs> I, this is and this is coming from my dev bias, um, I see DevOps, most DevOps things, as ops people uh, getting very angry at developers for being schmucks in a corner, just messing everything up. <laughs> um, and having been a developer in the corner messing things up from Charity's perspective, I, I understand. Um, uh, she and I will often honestly joke that she approaches uh, conversations with developers with a stick. You, it's time for you to be on call. It's time for you to own your code. Like, you should be doing this. And I like to use a carrot. Hey, wouldn't your life be better if you don't have ops breathing down your neck? Wouldn't your life be better if you could kind of close that feedback loop yourself on how your code is behaving after you've hit deploy or after someone has hit deploy? Um, I think... If the first wave of DevOps was ops people learning how to automate their work in code, right, bringing, uh, you know, all the infrastructure as code and config as code and, and ways to automate that work and make it faster, um, the second wave of DevOps is definitely helping developers learn to ops, which is owning their code in production. Um, I just think so much of it still comes from such a heavy ops bent that it alienates a lot of developers. Um, when I think about my experiences using the monitoring tools that we had before Facebook, um, you know, Charity would come and show me her dashboards and kind of shake them and be like, what did you do? And I would look <laughs> at her dashboards and be like, I don't know. You're showing me CPU and write throughput on your Mongo instances. My code is talking about users and endpoints and builds and, um, you know, SDK versions. I, I don't know how this translates to this. So, and so many of honestly, tools still in this space, DevOps tooling, monitoring, whatever, are built for that ops audience. Right. And, and for us, Honeycomb has always been about how do we ensure that no matter the population, you know, whichever type of engineer, we can make sure that the nouns that matter in their world are reflected in the tooling, right? Because that's how you build up that familiarity. It's, oh, I can make sense of this tool because I see these things I'm familiar with. You show me a graph that tells me that, um, you know, we're still talking about latency, but latency is up not for a given Mongo shard, but for a specific endpoint for a most important customer, starting with the build that just included my big change. I know exactly where to start looking. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very different um, way to drive action than the ops or even DevOps first model. I love it. That's awesome. So it we're here and we're at reInvent um, having this talk. So I'd love to you know what brought you to reInvent. What's Honeycomb excited about at reInvent? Love to hear more. Honeycomb has all been all in on AWS since the beginning. Um, we love AWS and frankly, just excited to be part of the, um, the energy here. Specifically this year, the thing that we're really excited to announce is you know, we've always had integrations. We've always had ways for you to use various AWS products and get that data reflected in Honeycomb for you to manipulate and query. Um, but there were sort of disparate integrations in the past and only some tools were supported. And so um, you know, over the last few months, we've really made sure that um, we, plugging into CloudWatch Log and CloudWatch Metrics is possible. Okay. We want people to be able to uh, take 
any of the data that's flowing to those AWS from any AWS product into CloudWatch and be able to sort of divert that to Honeycomb instead. Uh, again, all due respect, our querying experience and the, you know, using that data in Honeycomb, uh, we think is friendlier and, and, and more accessible for broader population of engineers. And so... Friendlier than CloudWatch? Shocking. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, you know, again, like this goes back to the ops and dev. Yeah. Charity's, Charity knows lots of things I don't. I know lots of things Charity doesn't. We know that teams are made up of various Christines and Charities and people in between. And there's... This is, this is now me rambling a little bit, but uh, so much of our product experience is acknowledging these are teams of humans. How do we help them do their work with an awareness of each other? We're, we're out of a world where any individual engineer can hold the entire system in their head. It's up to the tools to do a better job of surfacing, oh, well, um, John was on call last week and saw something weird in the Mongo instance oh, crap, I'm on call this week. Something seems like it's going weird. Let me go see what I can do there. There's a, there's a lot to usability that isn't just, um, you know, make the buttons cleaner. For us, it's a lot of thinking of how do humans hold context in their heads and share context with their teammates. That's awesome. Uh, and so for customers who are going to use these integrations, um, are they, so they're, they're pulling CloudWatch logs, they're pulling CloudWatch metrics into Honeycomb. What else are they pulling into Honeycomb and how are they um, using that data on the same platform? Well, I think of, I mean, logs and metrics, are they're a transport mechanism. They're a shape of data. Um, so hopefully they would say that they're pulling in, um, you know, signs of what their applications are actually doing. Um, we, you know, our customers use us to, there's the, there's the kind of hair on fire problem of, Everything is broken. I don't know why. Let me go look at the telemetry and see if I can figure it out. Um, but also, you take that and you sort of stretch out the time horizon and dial down the adrenaline a little, a little bit. And that same motion of, I have a hypothesis, let me verify it and, and continue and repeat if necessary, also applies to performance optimization, um, you know, experimentation, anything where you are trying out some code, you want to see how it performs in production, and you want to really closely understand that so that you can do that next iteration around the loop better. Um, again, we are really interested in the application layer. We think that's where all the business logic is. We think that's where all the, these days, a lot of where the complexity lies um, and have that flow through CloudWatch into Honeycomb okay. so that our users can understand their software better. Is there, I mean, I know that you're obviously more developer from the developer perspective. Um, do you see any differences in observability with the trends of containerization and container orchestration and, and dealing with apps in that environment? Hugely. Um, I mean, before Honeycomb started, no one was really using observability in this context. You walk the floor, reinvent in 2016, and you would not have seen observability on a booth the way that half the companies here seem to. Um, and so, it was Splunk, pretty much. I mean, uh, I mean, Splunk at the time, it was still <laughs> logging. I don't think they were using the word yeah. observability. <laughs> yeah. um, only, you know, small teams inside Twitter or Netflix were, were sort of playing with that word. And, um, uh, you know, I think of the rise of containers and orchestration as really a forcing function that broke monitoring in a lot of, traditional monitoring in a lot of ways. Um, you think about how monitoring tools work, right? You have a dashboard, you're basically defining questions ahead of time, what's important. Well, when, you when you're in a world of five app servers that you're like very carefully taken care of, it's pretty easy to be like, okay, well, I want this graph by these five app servers and show the CPU and there's only, only ever going to be five lines on a graph and yeah. I can look at that and, and make sense of it. Well, when you start to replace those app servers with containers and you break those mo that monolith out into microservices and then you use Kubernetes and you're cycling through these pod IDs multiple times in a day, suddenly those five clean lines turn into 5,000 like disjoint little segments. Um, I mean, forget if a, a, a monitoring or quote unquote observability tool price is based on host, like forget that. That's <laughs> even just making sense of um, what is important to look at today is, is hard. When I think about observability versus monitoring, um, 
you may have heard the phrase unknown unknowns yep. about observability, right? Um, it's, it's, I don't know the questions to ask and I don't know like what will be important, but I know something will be important. I need to be have the flexibility to ask that question tomorrow. Right? A pod ID might exist tomorrow that didn't exist today. But working backwards from that, the reason that phrase has a lot of significance to me is monitoring is a known unknowns. You know what metrics matter. You just don't know what the values are. So you, you have them on a wall. And even going backwards again into the developer world, testing is like known knowns, right? You're doing different, each of these are a different practice for a different set of problems. And observability, the, the chaos that we've created for ourselves with, again, the containerization and, and uh, of everything means that observability is the only way forward as we make our worlds ever less predictable. Cool. I mean, you, you know, you mentioned pricing. It's funny you hit this. You mentioned pricing and per host doesn't work anymore. And I think it's super interesting because we've worked with a lot of customers who once they get to us, they, they start on a SaaS observability platform or logging platform or monitoring platform, whatever their flavor is. And once they scale to a certain size, the cost ends up so high that they start comparing that to hiring people and figuring out how to do it with open source. Um, so how does, how does Honeycomb solve that problem uh -huh. or do they? Um, well, we price based on sort of the, the volume of the data that you're sending us, okay. um, which based on how we, based on the sort of characteristics of that data tend to scale with the number of requests your system are handling. So for most of our customers, they find that that at least is predictable and understandable. The challenges that a lot of these other folks tend to run into is when the growth of your observability bill grows in a way that is unpredictable or does not scale in a, in a sane way with the scale of your system, right? If you're talking about a traditional monitoring tool um, that handles, say, custom metrics, uh, if you, say an enterprising developer realizes that it's really important to put customer ID mm -hmm. into your metrics as a custom metric because monitoring vendor doesn't care about your, your customers, individual customer IDs, um, taking that Putting that in can cause a huge explosion to your bill, not because your system is larger, not because you are bringing in more revenue or handling more traffic, but because you're trying to get better visibility into your system. We think that that's broken. That example, again, customer ID, is just another flavor of that host per host pricing. When you have, when the when your pricing scales on the fidelity of the data you're dealing with, that is a pretty painful. Thing to tie a dollar a thousand knives. Yeah. yeah, and you're you're inherently limiting. You know, I talk to folks all the time who are like, "Yeah, I have to go chase down engineers and tell them to take pe pieces of metadata out of our instrumentation because it's costing us too much." Right. What a painful <laughs> thing to do to have to lose insight into you know the, the 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 segments of your system that are interesting, especially the ones that are interesting to your business, uh, because some vendor has architected their data in a way that that costs too much. What a right. shame. Yeah. Um, have you, are there any challenges? I'm sure there are, but what challenges do you see in just in general in the observability space that aren't solved yet that you'd like to tackle in the future? Yeah. I think that one of the ongoing challenges, and I don't know if it'll ever be solved, but there's a lot of work that can be done. Is this question of, okay, something is wrong. I don't know what questions to ask, right? Because mm -hmm. again, whether you're using a logging tool or monitoring tool or, or like a real observability tool, you're effectively asking questions. Um, and especially for say an engineer newly hired onto a team, you don't have the intuition yet of, okay, well, what does this spike mean? Or what does it mean that this line is flat here? Um, where do I go next? And a question that um, we at Honeycomb think about a lot is how do we help that, you know, new engineer learn from what the seasoned engineers on a team are doing? Um, we do this in a couple of ways, not least of which by sort of allowing that, that seasoned engineer to be leaving like a paper trail for other folks to pick up on. Um, but again, I think it is, it is a hard problem that is never going to be solved by um, the vendors, product managers coming up with the more brilliant questions to encode into the product. Uh, we believe it's always going to be, how do we enable the humans on a team to help each other? How do we help uh, make it easier for a team to bring their new engineer up to the level of the best debugger? 
Um, and there's a lot more that tools can do than it seems to be standard out there on the expo floor. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Do you see AI fitting in? I do. Um, and, but not in the way that a lot of folks think, right? Uh, the traditional, I'm going to sprinkle some AI pixie dust on this problem um, approach looks like, oh, well, we have all of your telemetry data, so we will, um, and, and they, it seems to chart a path, on, seems to chart a line on this path, and if that line suddenly deviates, we'll, we'll let you know. And the challenge with that is, um, well, the simplest is, robot can't tell the difference between a load test and a DDoS attack. A human can. Right. Uh, there's context in there. When I think about how we train really effective machine learning models, um, you compare it to a, I mean, it relies on like a vast amount of easily classifiable data. Like self-driving cars. There's, you know, it's pretty straight, it's straightforward-ish. You have a photo of what the car is looking at. Is there a dog on the street or not? Um, if, it, if there's no dog, you can probably drive. If there is a dog or maybe a dog, you should probably slow down or stop, right? There are sane defaults in each of these directions. Um, folks outside your company can help classify these, this, this training data and your, your models can get smarter. None of that is true in the world of software. Every engineering team's systems are different from every other engineering team's systems. Um, there is no safe default when it comes to waking someone up in the middle of the night. You either wake them up too much and they burn out, get cranky, stop believing your tool, or you don't wake them up enough and things go wrong and no one's up to handle them. So I think we are much more interested in AI, um, or at least building, building useful models uh, to help folks understand the questions to ask, right? Isn't that much more interesting? Yeah. Oh, I don't know where to go. Oh, well, hey, the last time something like this happened, um, the expert who owned that part of the system ran this query, looked at this graph, looked for a trace like this. There's something interesting there that draws from, again, learning from what the experts do in a tool and allowing novices to start to emulate that. That's interesting. So instead of learning from what the system has done, learn from what the people have done to fix the problem. Yeah. Um, our, our field CTO, Liz, likes to talk about this as um, we, we don't want to build robots. We want to build mecha suits for your engineers. Right. Because your engineers, there's always going to be context judgment calls, intuition, and you're, you're never going to be able to automate around that um, or automate that away. What we can do is try to draw that out and try to spread that out so that that expert doesn't have to spend all their time teaching everyone else. Yeah, yeah, neat. Do you see um, any difference in, in uh, use of the product, importance of the product, uh, do you do anything different for enterprise customers versus like SaaS companies where, you know, they're monitoring their product? Honestly, um, across that boundary, yeah. not really. Honestly, it, we see usage patterns vary more based on, I'm sure there's a more scientific way of saying this, um, but how curious and empowered that engineering team is. Um, we have some teams that are used to, you know, they're used to the traditional APM world. Oh, this thing is out. Of, this thing will come ready out of the box, and this thing will just push answers to you, and you don't have to do any work. We'll just do serve you magic. And those engineers tend to be used to, oh, I'll just show up, and if there are no answers that make sense to me, I'll maybe poke a little bit and then go away and just sweep it under the rug. And then there are other engineering organizations. Um, I'll call out Intercom for one, who have a culture of, you know, an engineer in one part of an organization can just go explore and, and sort of um, ask questions of how their their software engages with another part, how customers, in, you know, how their customers or customers that they're interested in, big customers, small customers, I don't know, customers using a, the push part of their product um, interacts with another thing. And those, those organizations, we tend to see... Um, really like a lot more of this like active exploration. We tend to see engineering adjacent roles being pulled in because they tend to be cultures that where they're, uh, they are drawn towards a single sort of source of truth of what's happening with their production software and thus their customers. Um, and you know, my, my 
Intercom as the shining star um, told us once that they had a demo day, internal demo day, where every single demo had a honeycomb graph in it because that was how they showed the impact of their engineering work. Right? Like, and in many of those cases, there was a PM demonstrating that. So these are, uh, I would not say that that is a line drawn between SaaS and enterprise, um, but it's much more how, how does your engineering team engage with their software and their customers? The whole the whole focus of how people work together is so interesting. You know, I, I did a little bit of research. I've been used Honeycomb, did a little research before this. I'm like, okay, APM. And then now I'm dying to go try it. <laughs> it cool. sounds really interesting. Cool. Yeah, that that is cool. So um, off of observability for a second, we've been at AWS. It's day four. My voice is showing it. <laughs> um, uh, have you heard anything interesting that you're really excited about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but overall, we've just been thrilled by sort of the, the energy around um, around the expo floor um, in the sessions. We actually had a couple talks around how we use Graviton and Lambda together um, to power Honeycomb. And you know, the, the number of folks who are interested in, in how to continue pushing the boundaries of how they serve software and especially use on-demand compute um, has been pretty incredible. So when, when your product runs on AWS? Absolutely. Cool. Entirely on AWS. Awesome. Nice. Cool. Well, I think that's all I've got. Uh, anything else you wanted to share before we uh, call it quits? I think I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Visit thecloudpod.net to subscribe to the show, join our Slack channel, or sign up for our weekly newsletter. You can also find information on reaching our audience through a CloudPod sponsorship opportunity. A big thank you to today's guest, and thank you for listening.